Hello, it's David. This is my partially uh, decapitated STE on the bench today um, because I'm uh, doing some testing with the, the terrible fire. This is hopefully the last video that I release. Uh, what I want to do is to test this with some games. And uh, normally they boot off floppy. My original floppy in here isn't going to go too well because all my games are the GoTech can't boot off drive B. Now you've seen a uh, um, modification I uh, did recently on my STFM, I'll link it up here somewhere, um, where I did a switch to allow a drive AB swap so that the external drive became drive A and the internal drive became drive B and it lets you then boot from drive A which is an external GoTech. Now um, that's not so easy to do in the SCE because the uh, the chip, the, the, the um, drive select wire is rooted directly under there. That's the uh, that's the AY chip chip that generates the drive select signals for drive A and B. There's the two pins on the end here, and that's rooted directly through to this internal cable for um, both drive A and B. Uh, so trace cutting would be required in order to to make that work. Both those signals are rooted also to the external drive, but there are some jumpers down here, uh, which uh, these ones here W300 and W301 that allows you to control um, how that external drive behaves. So what you can do is actually make that external drive drive A by just a couple of changes to jumpers here. And obviously then you'd end up with um, two drive A's. But if you simply remove the internal drive, you can set that uh, jumper and the external will be drive A and it'll be a single floppy machine. Now I don't really want to go go about taking this all out of the, the case uh, to put these jumpers in uh, properly. They are actually uh, real uh, holes for the uh, for the jumpers. You can see here it's W300, W301 and uh, I think it's normally these two sides that are uh, normally connected. Um, you need to cut a trace between those two fit headers and, and they are normal 2.54 millimeter spacing. Uh, and then you'd be able to jump at the direction you want. You can control some things with this, but not enough to switch A and B just by these jumpers, which you can do with the uh, STFM. But remove the internal drive, only jumper 301, and what you'll end up with is the external drive behaving as both drive A and drive B. And I think that should probably be sufficient to allow me to boot some games. So what I'm going to try and do is to pop out my um, STE536 here. And I'm going to just try and fit, by surface mounting in effect, a, a jumper onto uh, the W301 pins. And I think what I might do is something along these lines, where I just try and solder a right angle a pin header strip onto W301 like that. Now, if you want to do a, um, a proper drive A and B swap, then uh, the conventional way to do this on the STE is to lift, uh, or first of all, socket the AY chip here, and then lift pins 19 and 20, which are these two end ones, take them out of the chip, provide a switch there, a uh, like, like I had in the other one, a um, uh, single throw dual pole switch that basically swaps them around and then feed it back into that socket. And that's a pretty straightforward um, modification to do, and I could probably do that quite quickly as well with a bit of um, perf board and a couple of um, 40 pin dip 40 sockets. However, the way my um, ST536 works, and you see this, uh, oops, yeah. you see this big uh, support structure mounted here around the top, that actually sits on that AY chip. And uh, that is sort of part of the, um, what's the term? That is it's kind of, it's part of the support structure for the ST536. So that's not really, uh, yeah, I mean, I could remove the green support and you know, try and adjust just the height so it sits there nicely, but it's not really a trivial fix for the particular problem that I'm um, trying, to, uh, trying to work with here. So I think this nasty, nasty, hacky solution might actually be a better option. Yeah, I really am going quick and hacky today. I haven't even changed my K-tip, which I use for my SMD soldering. Um, so yeah, this is going to be a very brute force and uh, uh, and rough and ready. What I'm going to do is first just add some uh, 
solder bead it up in a big way onto uh, onto these pads there we go standing nice and proud and obviously i could simply just uh, do a solder bridge there but that would be quite a permanent change well at least it would require the solder design to, to change it so i don't want to do that uh, now what we're going to try and do is introduce <laughs> this is going to be quite awkward introduce all three of these at once somehow melting all of the solder in one go that's not too bad i don't think that's flat two are down this last pin actually this one doesn't really do anything at all because this is already jumpered on the board but i'm going to try and oh i've blobbed it too much Come on. There we go. That actually doesn't look too bad. Let's try and come in from a different angle. Do it one at a time. There we go. Now, that is, like I say, particularly nasty, particularly quick and dirty. But I think that might do a short-term job now what obviously we can't do is there's no point fitting a sort of long cable to that and providing a switch uh, outside of the machine because uh, well we would have to provide a, another switch that somehow disabled the internal floppy disk I suppose the way if I were to do that I would simply provide an interposer board uh, on the um, FTC thing here FTC um, interface uh, plug a board in here and then have the actual drive select line switched uh, on here because they are both here we could switch that here and then that at the same time and that would probably would that do the job it might do the job i, I still yeah i'm still hazy exactly what w300 does but uh, uh that is i think that's all about passing through the other signals so that you can have a daisy daisy chained external disk drive it's the sort of thing that you'd have to do on the original air st m and st without the f but I think that should be enough now. And then all we would do is fit a jump on that side there just to be storage. And on that side there to make the external dual drives uh, and obviously disconnect this. Let's, um, let's spin this around, put it back on the desk and give it a try. Allow me to commend to you the sponsor of this video, PCBWay. Now, as the name suggests, they are a PCB manufacturing company. But they also do PCB assembly, PCB design consultancy, sheet metal fabrication, CNC machining, 3D printing, and they have an extensive library of shared projects contributed by their users. There's also a module store where whole items can be purchased pre-made. If you think any of these maker-centric services could be of interest to you, please do have a look at their website. I thank them very much for supporting my work. Okay, so here's the setup. What I've done is uh, I've been testing my SCE536. So I've actually swapped that out and I've put in the original 68000 to avoid any potential compatibility issues uh, Issues there. We've got Emitos 1.3 over here on the dual ROM. And what I've done is I've simply unplugged the power to the floppy at the moment. Now that may not prove to be sufficient if um, if this is interfering because there'll be, there'll be you know, um, voltages on this, this cable. If, um, if the drive sort of half responds or something, it could be that that interferes with the exchange, in which case, fine, we'll have to take the, um, the actual floppy connector out. Um, but um, I'm trying to avoid that for now. Uh, I've got my jumper set in the right-hand position, which should make my external GoTek over here, both drive A and drive B. Uh, what we'll do is we will um, put a USB in here, and try and boot through it but first of all let's just uh throw uh throw the switch get the uh get the desktop up just prove everything is as i said it was there we go 
So over here, you see we've got a 68,000 STE with four megabytes and A and B it's detected, even though there's only one drive connected. So um, let's uh, let's put in something that won't auto boot. Okay, so I've got just one of my utility disks in there um, and we'll have a look at drive A. Green lights on and there we go. We've got a copy of Emutos, uh, Emucon, uh, some old RAM testing programs, my uh, UIP transfer, micro IP transfer. Um, we'll just check that we can run programs from it. Yep, there we go, that's it, we um, Perfect, that's behaving as drive A. Now, in theory, it should also behave as drive B. There we go, exactly the same behavior. And I should be able to run programs from this as well. I do have my network connector in, so this should actually obtain an IP address. Uh, there we go. Yep, DHCI, DHCP. There we go. It's retained like So perfect. Uh, this is behaving both as A and B. What I was going to say is possible some games might get confused by the um, by having A and B and the same disc in both. But um, we'll see. Things like uh, maybe F19 Midwinter, the sort of things that actually I hope will benefit from my accelerator, um, might um, might not like that because I think they're they're multi multi floppy disks. Anyway, uh, right. So. That said, let's turn that off. Let's um, let's load up a, a game. So I think Formula One GP I have on here somewhere. Okay, Formula One Grand Prix, uh, Grand Prix Disc One. I think that just that loads the intro, basically the uh, the demo sort of well, not demo intro thing. Uh, right, throw the switch. Emitos one point three. Yep, four megabyte, and. There we go, I'm seeing signs of life. I've got there a bit too late because <laughs> it's showing track 53 and it's already finished loading. Uh, oh, there we go. Yep. Ticking away. I mean, it's obviously booted. Now, what's going to happen when it asks for disk 2? That's, um, that's the big question. I think this is all just intro memory serves yeah here we go oh there we go that looks like a, uh, a classic Mac on his desk there I don't remember this I'll be honest all right let's skip it and there we go right okay insert disk two so all right let's pop up uh, to disk B on there and uh, try that That's, I'm trying to fit a thumb in the screen there. Well done. Yes, come on. I think we're. I think we're there. Disc three. Perfect. Okay, well, I could go digging around the manual, but I don't think I'm going to bother. So let's uh, let's try another one. I think I had um, well, I've got quite a few things on here, but I think I had F19 on here. Let's uh, let's boot that one. Hopefully, we get uh, similar results. Again, it's a multi-disc uh, game. Okay, this one's a crack. So we get a joystick. Do have a joystick plugged in. And it's booting up nicely. But the key thing will be when it gets to disc two. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. There we go. Please insert disc B. And I think it is trying to auto detect that. So let's switch to disc B. And I can. Yep, there we go. Perfect.
No trouble at all. Okay, so this is Shuttle now. This is um, a game that actually would really benefit from the accelerator if I can get it working with it. But this is one of the, the um, games that won't work on a uh, 030 natively. For some reason, it has a bus error uh, in the execution of the program. And um, that uh, this is just a crack through. And um, that uh, obviously, you know, that is an area of incompatibility with the 030. It's, they're, they're called long exception frames. And um, the 030, I think the, the 010 and above has them. And uh, that is uh, the sort of thing that will, will break compatibility. So anyway, we're, we've got a 68, this is plain 68,000 here at the moment. So this is going to chug along if it works at all. Um, but it shouldn't have the 030 problem. And we'll run the demo, and I believe this is when it asks for disk two. Yep. Okay, so we'll flip that over to disk B. Click the mouse, all right. So this one doesn't auto detect. Disk one or two, all right. Well, just two's in. Maybe this is confused by the now disk two. Maybe this is confused by the um, disk in two drives problem. Or maybe it's the fact that I haven't unplugged this cable. Yeah, that that might be a bit dodgy. Oh no, well we got there in the end. Yeah, this is Chuggington. Okay, so there we go. That is the mod. Uh, just that little uh, three-way jumper. Um, I had it in the right position there. If I move it to the left position and I reconnect the uh, the disk drive, then we're back to stock configuration. Um, perhaps actually if you're doing this in anger, you might want to actually disconnect the whole um, uh, floppy disk cable, not just the power line. Uh, and this is the actual uh, AY chip under here where if we were to actually do the mod properly, these two end pins here would be lifted and, and basically flipped in their in their socket, and that would um, that would actually do the job properly. Switching over drive A and B, so it just tidy that back up there. We will uh, stick a disc in the drive there and um, power ourselves back on. Drive A and B as expected. Uh, and let's have a look and see whether we can read both drives. Sorry, my hand goes and covers that up, doesn't it? Uh, right, so drive A should contain... I think I might have uh, messed that disk up. Uh, we'll try formatting it, maybe. Uh, drive B, okay, drive B works. There's Blitbench running over there. So let's try formatting uh, drive A, double-sided, uh, test. I can hear it clunking, the light's on. There we go, that looks promising. So drive A, drive B, and can we copy from drive B to drive A? I can hear it going clunk, clunk, clunk. Perfect. And the proof of the pudding is, can we change the disk on drive B without affecting drive A? Yep, there we go. That's it. Simple as that. Bit of a hack, but um, could get me out of a tight spot on occasion. Thanks very much for watching. Why not hit subscribe if you haven't done that yet? Down there somewhere. It'll be good for you. See you next time.